Okay, um, we'll get started in a, in a few seconds, so settle down. Just trying to work out the microphones. Is that, is that working, yeah? Yeah, okay, cool. Okay. So, um, a reminder, you guys coming in a bit late, use the back of the room next time, please. There's some, there's some stairs at the back. Right. So, end, nearly the end of week two, and um, some more on hydrostatics today, this morning. A few things to point out again on the um, online resources. Um, Still the uh, recommended reading in the cor core textbook and also the condensed notes, a couple of supporting videos which were um, snippets of content from last year covering some of the, the maybe more involved derivations. Some of them I went over already on, mon uh, on Monday and I'm going to go over some more of it today. And then also um, the quiz. That, so some people asked me to clarify the quizzes are open until the last day of the semester teaching. So that's, I think, the 17th of December, midnight on the 17th of December. All of the week's quizzes are open until then. You can take them as many times as you like, and you don't have to end on the highest score. The system remembers the highest score that you got. So if you, if you try it again and you get less, it'll still remember the highest score. And it, as long as your kind of total score over all of the 10 weeks of quizzes there's 10 weeks of taught content, um, 10, 10 quizzes. As long as the total score is over 80%, then you get um, the credit, the 5% credit for the module. <clears throat> okay, so the, we've got on the synchronous side, we've got lecture today, the second of the week, and tomorrow there's the tutorial. So it has been confirmed it's, it's in person. It's going to be in Reynolds Building, uh, which is on North Campus. And you have um, the room allocation is going to appear in your timetable. I'll, I'll send an announcement up around. It, for some reason, hasn't been uh, already finalized uh, for, you know, in, until, until very recently. I think there was an issue with room availability. So you're going to be split into five groups. There's going to be a number of uh, GTAs, graduate teaching assistants, who are going to help try to make it as interactive as possible. And the exact room that you're going to be allocated is going to be on your timetable. And I'll try and also copy the message onto Blackboard in case you don't see it on your timetable for some reason. OK. And that, the tutorials are going to be every two weeks. So it's, 
this this week and then next week I'll give you another sheet to look at and then the, the, the answers for that will be uh, the, the two weeks after, two weeks today or tomorrow. Okay, so covering, uh, summarizing some of the stuff that we introduced on Monday, something to get you thinking. This is a thought experiment where you've got a steady tank of fluid in a reservoir where we're saying the fluid is at rest and we're asking to make some observations about the, uh, the pressure at different locations. So there's, there's four kind of things to comment on. The first one, what can we say about all of the points that are at depth one? Anyone want to? The same pressure, yep. Hydrostatics tell us that when a fluid is at rest and when the fluid is at a constant density and it's connected by the same body of fluid throughout, then the uh, pressure will be the same. What about at depth two, we have points A and C. The same, yeah. Even though there isn't a direct connection in the horizontal direction, it's the same depth of fluid and it's connected uh, by this path, so that's still okay, that still applies. What about B, little b and big B? Which one's gonna be the higher pressure? Big B, right. Remember that we treat fluid at rest just like blocks of matter, and the, the, the greater the number of blocks of matter that you have above you, or on top of that point, then the higher the force, the higher the pressure. And then um, C and D, so this one and this one, slightly more complicated. Which is gonna be the higher pressure? Yeah, over there. Yeah, D, that's exactly right. Yeah, D, so again, think of the blocks of the fluid and the one block of, you know, one, one uh, unit volume of, of mercury is, has a lot more weight than the unit volume of water, so the force above that is, is going to be a lot greater. Good. And that's exactly what's happening in the atmosphere, right? So I think you start, those of you in aerospace will start to be looking at the international standard atmosphere this semester and starting to look at how our, you know, we can't really do much in aerospace without understanding of air. And if you like, the first step in that is understanding how air varies in the region that we're going to be using it. And the example here is showing how, you know, in, in a kind of cartoon manner or schematic way, showing how the particles of air are are varied across a slice of atmosphere. And of course, because of the force of gravity, right? Because there's, there's a greater um, attraction near the surface, they tend to cluster these, um, this, the air density tends to be higher near to the surface. And as you go further away, there tends to be less, right? There's, there's, there's less of an attractive force um, kind of uh, keeping the air together and pulling it together. So, when we talk about one atmosphere of pressure, right? So this is um, a unit of pressure that we often use and will routinely use in engineering in this, in this um, module and in many others. One atmosphere of pressure is nothing more than the weight of a column, an, uh, an imaginary column of air that is, you know, a unit area, maybe a meter squared, extending from the surface of Earth all the way up to the edge of the atmosphere. And if you are able to calculate that weight, then the, the, the force per unit area that that exerts on the surface of the Earth is um, an atmosphere of pressure, or one bar. Now, clearly, that tells us a few things. That tells us that atmosphere is, in a, is an average term, right? It's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same at any point on the surface of Earth where there's a difference in height or a difference in, in weather conditions. And actually, it's going to be changing all the time, even at the same point. Because one of the things that we introduced last time was that if in the analysis of hydrostatics, the pressure is 
um, we're assuming that the, that the fluid is, is static. As soon as we allow the analysis to include a dynamic fluid, then the pressure is changing again. So if, of course, as is the case in our atmosphere, there is a dynamic air, there's wind, there's a variation in, in velocity, you know, in a very complex way across the height of that column, then of course the pressure and the amount of air per unit volume is going to be changing. So this is a very approximate measure. But nevertheless, it's, it's good enough for our purposes. Okay. Right, so a few other concepts. It's mainly, we're going to be mainly introducing some, some concepts today. So we're going to be introducing and, and kind of going over some of the definitions that you probably have seen in the course book so far. Um, again, if you've, got, if, you've, if you've got questions that are arising, we've got um, people on the forum now, so if you want to ask questions, you can do, and um, you know, in real time we'll, we can answer those questions. The atmosphere, like I said, um, is, is a way to measure the pressure as, as a result of the air, the column of air that's um, above the surface of a, a certain point. That's a big number. And actually, if we're always operating at the surface of Earth, we can take that number away and make a more practical number, which is the deviation of the pressure from that amount. And that's the gauge pressure. So often, the pressure that we talk about in engineering in practical terms is the pressure that we measure. And usually, we measure the, when, we're, when we're taking measurements as engineers, we take the deviation away from a normal. And in this case, it's no different. We're looking at the deviation away from the atmospheric pressure. When it's higher, it's, it's called the gauge pressure. Sometimes when it's below the atmospheric pressure, it's, it's called the vacuum pressure. Or, but it, it, you can also think of it as the gauge pressure, just so that you're aware of the terminology. And this is just a, a relative measure of the pressure. And it's a lot more convenient to you know, remember the difference rather than the, the absolute number. And yeah, so next, um, next Monday we'll, we'll take a little bit of a look at some of the measuring devices that we use in fluid dynamics. Um, and this is, if you like, this is the first one. A pressure gauge reads the difference between the local pressure and the atmospheric pressure. And we use this all the time. Is there any questions on that before we move on? No, good. Okay, so two other things that you will have seen if you've had a look at the textbook. If you haven't, then I can introduce them now. That we're going to use a lot in this module and in, in future versions of fluid mechanics are specific gravity and specific uh, weight. And if you haven't noticed by now, but then, then I can point out that in engineering, we're always looking for quick tricks, convenient um, tools to simplify our analysis, to simplify comparison, to make it clear of what is the critical values in our, in our design, in our evaluation. And in doing so, we often look for ratios or we often look to combine um, you know, common numbers so that the amount of information that we have to remember is reduced. It's just a purely practical um, way, of, way of doing things in engineering. And one such example is the specific gravity, which given that you know, often we are looking at the relative um, forces of objects immersed in fluids or two fluids next to each other, it becomes a really practical term, particularly for buoyancy. And the specific gravity, it sounds you know, a bit kind of complicated, not really clear what it is. It's, all it is is the ratio of two densities. And we usually use a common density as the denominator. 
So it's usually liquid, uh, liquid, it's usually water. Sometimes it's air. And so then you're looking at what is the relative density of a, of a, of a quantity re uh, relative to a kind of a commonly known fixed uh, value. And you know, in particular, if it's water, that tells you whether or not it's going to float, right? And in, in buoyancy, uh, you're going, which I think you're going to look at in around week seven, um, we, you're going to be using that quite a lot. If it's less than one, that means that the, the fluid or the object that is in the water has less density than the water, so it's going to float. If it's more than one, it's going to sink. Now, so specific gravity is pretty useful for uh, buoyancy. Specific weight, we saw it um, briefly on Monday, and you will have seen it probably several times already in the notes, is, used, is represented by gamma, right? So this looks like an italic Y, like gamma. And this is purely the practical combination of um, gravity, the gravitational constant G, and density. Now, you're going to go on probably in next semester in dynamics, in uh, it might be called dynamics, it might be called mechanics, but it's next semester. It's probably one of the hardest modules next semester. It's one of the best as well. But it's, um, you're going to be looking at how forces vary um, and how objects respond, what, what the motion that objects have in response to forces. And one of the things you look at is the force of gravity and how it varies. Of course, gravity is a force which is, is um, a function of how far you are away, or an object is away, uh, from another object. And generally, if we're talking about Earth, that object is the dominant object, the dominant mass, and you're talking about how far away are you from the center of Earth. Now, most of the time when we're on the surface of Earth, we are a very similar distance away from the center of Earth, and so we can use the, the constant g. Uh, which is commonly taken 9.81. Again, that's going to vary quite a lot, depending if you go up or down, um, you know, a hill or a mountain, and actually depending on how, what is the actual geological composition of, of material beneath, between you and the centre of Earth. But nevertheless, we choose to have this as a constant, and because it's a constant, we can combine it with the density of the, the fluid that we're looking at. So. We often combine density and gravitational constant G, 9.81, into one term, gamma, and we call this the specific weight. And by remembering this um, you know, quantity for a different fluid, it's just another thing that um, saves a bit of time. As an example then, for mercury, with the, um, the symbol HG, then you have a density of 13,560 kilograms per meters cubed. So the specific gravity is the ratio of that number to the density of water, which is around 1,000. So mercury is, is, a, is 13 and a half times more dense than water. And specific weight is of mercury is the density of mercury times g, so basically uh, times 10. And, okay, so often you'll see these information provided in this form. So not only do you have to be aware of how to kind of obtain that information, you have to be aware of how to use it. So maybe in an exam, you won't be given the density of mercury, but you'll be given the specific gravity of mercury. Okay, that again is probably a new thing. But is there any questions on it? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the question was, uh, do you always assume that it's water? Now, strictly speaking, no, right? Because it, it's, it's just a ratio and it could be, it could be anything, uh, but Generally, if it's a liquid, it, you can do. If it doesn't say, if, if a question or a, a reference table doesn't say, you can assume it's water. If it's, I think the rule of thumb is, if it's not water, then you would expect the question or the reference table to say so. 
Yeah? The units of? Of what? Of specific gravity? Yeah, no, there's no unit, yeah. Ah, so that's, yeah, there's a mistake there, yeah. So this one should be for here. Yeah, well spotted. I'll try and correct that in the notes. Other questions? No, all good? Okay. So, right. Next few slides, we're going to show how we can provide um, a set of equations that relate the forces on a fluid element to um, its motion. Okay, so it's maths, it's early on a morning, but um, this is also the same content that was in the um, supporting video, and I'll go through it as, as clearly as I can, and then we'll leave some time for some questions. But it's important that you understand this, so it's worth going through it again. The, Again, um, there's already been a few questions on this particular observation on the forum. Um, please uh, continue to use that and have a look at the forum as your first port of call if, 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 if you do have questions on this. So, it's quite exciting because we're going to see very in a few slides how we can get to one of the fundamental equations of, 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 of uh, matter, which is Navier-Stokes, uh, applied to fluid dynamics, and you're going to use this all the way through the uh, degree, and we, we use it routinely in engineering and, and scientific research, and you know, like I said a couple of, couple of weeks ago, from aerodynamics of cars to weather forecasting. And this is, it all starts basically with analy an analysis like this. That's what that is. Okay, so you have, um, you start with an element of fluid. And so, on Monday we looked at a wedge shape, like a triangle extended into the page, and this time we're looking at a cube. It doesn't really matter. Someone asked the question quite rightly, what, you know, why, why do you choose a wedge, why do you choose a cube? You can choose whatever you like. And the reason we chose a wedge last time is because we wanted to choose a surface that had a component in X and Y. Um, the reason that we're going to choose a cube now is just that it's more convenient to use the same analysis in three dimensions. So we want a uniform shape. So starting point, we assume that our pressure is a 3D time-dependent quantity, so it has a function of x, y, z, and t, and we're going to analyze step by step the forces that are acting on the element of fluid. So we first look in the x direction, and we see we've got a pressure times by an area, and the area is in pink, which uh, in this particular case we have a cube for which the volume is dx, dy, dz and the area of that face is dz dy. And we're saying, okay, the difference in forces, remember that a pressure is a force per unit area, so a force is a pressure times an area. So the difference in forces is the pressure here uh, minus the pressure here. Now, someone quite rightly asked in the forum, why do you, why do you assume that it's increasing, right? So, because it says plus uh, partial d uh, p dx times dx. Um, and it looks like we're assuming that it's increasing, but actually what we're doing is we're just picking a direction and assuming and saying that if it goes in that direction, it's a positive. If it goes in the other direction, it's a negative. It doesn't mean that it's, we're saying that it has to increase because that gradient can still be negative, but it's, um, we, have to, we have to pick one. So once we write out the two terms that are, the two forces that are acting on that element, we can multiply them out and we can see that the, um, the terms with pressure on their own cancel out. So we have P dy dz minus P dy dz. And we get the expression that the force, df dx, is equal to basically the volume times by the pressure gradient, or minus the pressure gradient in the x direction. Everybody with me so far? Yeah? Okay, so, so the, the partial derivative is a way to analyze how much a quantity is changing with respect to one variable when actually that, that, that quantity is a, is a function of more than one variable. 
Okay, so it just means that we're looking at how that quantity is changing just in one, uh, in response to one variable x. But otherwise, just consider it as a term which says if you go a small amount in the x direction, there's going to be a small change in the pressure. And then we're saying how much of a change in pressure will there be over the distance dx. So you times the gradient by that term, and you just get an incremental change of pressure. Yes? So basically, all we know is that the sum of the forces in one component is equal to the partial derivative. Is equal to the partial derivative in this component? Right. So, yeah, so the, the comment was that, in, in, in summary, you can say that the sum of the forces, when the fluid is at rest, or not necessarily, the sum of the forces is equal to the pressure change in one direction. And just to kind of show you that that's the case in the other directions as well, we look one by one in, in the other two uh, spatial dimensions. So here, we're saying what is, the, what is the equivalent expression in the y direction? So again, look at the pressure that is acting on the face dx, dz, which is, which is this one, dx and dz. So that's the area of the pink faces. Um, and we say, okay, how much is it changing when we go from this point to this point? Again, which are assuming a, a positive gradient in a positive up direction in the y. And again, in, in a very, very similar way, once you get that expression, you can, you can expand it to show that the PDX dz minus PDX dz cancel out, and you're left with partial uh, dp dy times the volume. And we get exactly the same in the third dimension in z. The only thing that changes is that the force is now going in the z direction, and that's perpendicular to this front and back face. And the front and back face has area dx and dy, which is why we put, put those there. Okay, that looks pretty complicated, but if you do it step by step and apply the same logic at, on each row, then you should be able to see where it's coming from. Yes? So would you be, is, is, is the question, would you, would, you be, would you know the variation of the pressure? Yes, yes absolutely, absolutely. So when we... Um, what we're doing now is, is defining our toolkit. We're setting up an equation that we can use in a general situation. That's why we, go, well, that's why we zoom in. So remember, this, this cube is assumed to be right at the center of a, tank of a very large tank of fluid. And if we can solve it for that tiny, tiny cube in the tank of fluid, then we can solve it for the whole tank using um, integration methods. So it's really important that we get our toolkit right. Yep. Okay, so the question is again, will we be given the pressure variation in a question? I think um, what we are constructing is an analytical form, and if, um, I'll show you on the next couple of slides that we get an expression that we can then use in an engineering um, tool. So wait a couple of slides, and if, you still, if it's still not clear, let me know. Right, so what we have from these three expressions is essentially they are just equal to uh, the pressure gradient times the volume. And this is where it gets a little bit more tricky because we introduce the gradient operator. Hands up if you've never seen the gradient operator before. That's basically everybody. Okay, fair enough. Grad and uh, the tri upside down triangle is like uh, an essential element of, of vector calculus, uh, something that you will see in your maths this year, and, and something that you will use again and again in engineering. It appears in fluid mechanics, solid mechanics, you know, um, 
electromagnetics, um, in, in all walks of, of, of science and engineering, you will see vector calculus terms. Anything basically that, that, that has some kind of 3D uh, variation of quantities. And for now, think of it as a vector. It's a vector because it has an I component, J component, and K component. I being X, J, K, so J, Y, and K, Z. And if you take the gradient of a quantity, like pressure, it means you're going to create a vector that has, instead of X, Y, Z in each direction, it has the gradient of the pressure in each, in each coordinate direction as its three components. Okay? So, if we're going to, what our motivation is to try and combine these three expressions into one. And that's what we can do with a vector. So think of this as um, a vector equation where instead of df, x, df, y, df, z, we write bold font df, which has three components. And instead of uh, dpx, dpy, dpz, we have the gradient operator. And this is, you know, completely um, following the same um, steps as in the, in the textbook and in the supporting text. We can then summarize that purely by saying grad P, which is what we have here, grad P. The gradient of the pressure in three dimensions is equal to the force, big font, big F, divided by the volume, dx, dy, dz, remember that's the volume of the cube. And we actually often introduce a notation where the F takes a lowercase when it's the force per unit volume. So we're saying the pressure force is equal to the gradient of the pressure minus the gradient of the pressure because of our convention of Z being up. Right. Some big steps, some new concepts, um, some complicated notations. Um, absolutely appreciate this. You're not going to necessarily see how this all fits together straight away, but um, hopefully this is like a soft introduction to uh, a term that you're going to see quite frequently. If you've got more questions, um, well, I, I think um, you can put them on the forum because I, I want to move on. Right. So, we've defined our pressure force per unit volume, our pressure gradient, and we're now going to say all the forces that are acting on that fluid are um, combined using Newton's second law to say the sum of the forces that act on the fluid will equal to the, the mass times acceleration. If, if the fluid is stationary, then the mass times acceleration is zero, because the acceleration is zero. And so the force per unit volume, F is equal to PA, because the, dense, the volume here is divided uh, on the other side, so you get the small f, and you have the, you're left with the density times by the acceleration. And this is, this is, this is very interesting, because this is our kind of summary of all the forces that can act on a fluid, right? This is the complete description of, of a fluid's behavior in, um, in a system. It has not just pressure, it has a gravity force, and it has a viscous force. So, this is the first step towards defining the, the Navier-Stokes equations, which gives you an exact and absolute and um, always consistent description of, of fluids. That's all it is. It's sec Newton's second law, the sum of the pressure force, the gravity force, and the viscous force is equal to acceleration. And we're not going to take that much further in this module, but I want to introduce that to you now so that when you see this data, in data modules, you can remember that this is um, here. You saw it first. This is where it all comes together. And according to how much detail and accuracy you need, you can come back to this point and add more terms, add more information, add more accuracy. But for now, we're going we're to plug in a few terms. So we've got the pressure force is our gradient of pressure. Our gravity force is our, our mass per unit volume times gravity. And we're not going to worry about viscosity. And we're not going to worry about acceleration because it's at rest. 
So if the acceleration is zero, we're left with the equation, the pressure gradient is equal to the gravity force. And that is what we, what we looked at yes, um, on Monday. We, 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 we uh, used the expression dp dz is equal to minus density times g, which is equal to minus the specific weight. And we used that um, at the end of the, um, of the lecture on Monday to, do, to, to introduce um, hydrostatics and how it can be used to, to, to calculate the depth of a fluid um, below the surface. And we're going to use it again. But now I've shown you how you can get to that uh, from an element description of fluid via uh, a way to describe all of the forces acting on a fluid when we need to do so. Okay, so we're going to come down to earth a little bit and start practicing, putting this into practice. This is, um, this is important, but it's something that you're going to have to look at uh, several times to, to, to fully appreciate, perhaps. Um, but, you know, you need to understand what are the assumptions and what are the steps involved in, under, in getting to this set of equations. And, you know, if you've, if you've understood this, then give yourself a pat on the back. This is it's a great progress. You've just understood how, from first principles, uh, to understand the, the, the complete description of fluids in a hydrostatic fluid. Okay. So time for an example. Now we're looking at, um, you know, a typical exam question, a typical application of hydrostatics to um, a problem. You have a, a container of fluid which is given, and you're told that, well, it doesn't say there, but it should say there that this is a fluid system that is at rest. If the fluid system is at rest, you know that the acceleration is zero, and you can apply the equations that we just developed on the other screen. And remember, dp dz is equal to rho minus rho g. If you integrate both sides, you get the pressure difference is equal to the uh, constant density uh, times gravity times the height difference. The, at this point, the most important thing to remember is that z is defined as vertically upwards is positive. And we're going to, we're going to, we're asking the question, I think in the, um, in your notes, you've just got the answer, so um, feel free to make further notes or I'll, I'll, also, I'll also put the, the full uh, working on, online. I think it's also um, here, actually, so you can put your comments here. We're asked to find what is the pressure if we know the pressure at this point, which is the interface between the two liquids, what is the pressure at the bottom and what is the pressure at the top? Okay. First observation. This tank is a, is a weird shape. It's not, it hasn't got straight sides. It's got slanted sides at 75 degrees. How important do you think that the shape of the tank is here? Absolutely nothing. Yep, absolutely right. Yeah, it doesn't matter one iota. This, the shape of the tank is completely immaterial to the question, what is the pressure at the top and at the bottom? If you needed to know the weight of the complete tank, then, then yeah, you need to know the volume. But it doesn't matter one little bit for now. Okay, so... Walking you through the analysis, right? So, the first part, the pressure at the surface. We're saying, okay, what is P2? The pressure at the surface is, so we're starting here. So, P2 is the pressure at the surface. Really, if I'm doing this properly, I'm going to write 1 here and 2 here, just so that I don't forget that this is point 0.1 and this is point 0.2. But I've said instead the, the word surface. So, pressure at the surface is equal to pressure at the interface minus the change in height between here and here. Um, times the uh, specific weight of water. Right, so it's, it's a minus sign, which means that the change in height, which is positive because it's going in the z direction, what does it mean? Yes, it's a really good question, and it's, it's, it's a red herring. 
You don't need it to answer this part of the question. So it's, it's just there to make you think about uh, what, what, what information you need. It's a typical example from an exam question. Maybe the next part of the exam question would be, what's the weight? But the pressure at the surface is going to be less than the pressure at the interface because it has less fluid above it. We, if this is free to atmosphere, then it might have air above it. So it's not going to be completely a zero pressure, but it's going to be less. So you need to know what is the specific weight. So it's the density of water times G. And then you can take the pressure at the interface, and you can then take um, the... That, that should be the other way around. That should be a minus. Sorry about that. Um, and it, you should uh, be able to then... Um, take this pressure away from the interface pressure and get the surface pressure, which is correct here. So it's 90,000. Yeah? Yeah, so you have to times it by the, the, the height difference. Yeah, there might be something wrong. Let me, let me take another look at this later. In fact, I will leave this over to you guys to put some notes on here so you can, you can help me out. Okay. And then the exact same principle applies when you're going in the other direction. When you're going... Okay, yeah, and I appreciate there's probably a bit of confusion with the numbers, but we'll sort that out for you. When you're going in the other direction, you, you have to find the specific, the specific weight of mercury, you have to find the height, you have to use the same units, and then you're increasing in pressure. So then you have to add the, the hydrostatic pressure due to the difference that you're traveling through the mercury. Always apply the kind of common sense rule. If you're going up, make sure that your pressure is going down. If you're going down in the fluid, make sure that your pressure is going up. And if you remember that when you've got to the end of the question, when you've got to the end of your calculation, quite often you'll spot a mistake. So always apply the common sense rule. Okay. So... A couple of things to point out. Last, on Monday, we, we went through the process of analyzing the variation of forces in a fluid, and we came up with a, a few rules that we applied at the beginning of this lecture. Pressure in a horizontal plane of a connected constant density fluid is constant. Pressure in a vertical direction of the same fluid is dependent only on the pressure gradient times, um, um, it, it's dependent on the gravity times density. And the um, pressure is a point force, and it's independent of the shape of the container, which was pointed out in the last example. So if you have this quantity, and you integrate it, you have this general expression, which we used in the last example, which relates the pressure change to the change in height. Now, the analysis that we perform at this point depends on whether it's a gas or whether it's a liquid. So far, we've just assumed that it's, we've only considered it in a liquid. And we need to be aware of how we would treat a gas. So when it's a liquid, so we introduced in the, on Monday the fact that if it's a liquid, we take the rho g <coughs> outside the integral because because liquids are much higher density and they have much, much lower compressibility than gases. It's very hard to squeeze them. So to all intents and purposes, most of our analysis will um, not require you to, to consider the change in density of a liquid. So it's entirely reasonable <clears throat> to neglect that variation and to take the, the density outside of the integral. 
However, you cannot do that with air. You cannot do that with gas. Um, if you look at the same expression, so the same expression, um, P2 minus P1 equal to minus the integral from 1 to 2 of rho g dz. When we look at a gas, two things are happening. Usually, it's covering a much larger range. So you can see, if we're looking at from the surface of the ocean to the, to the, to the bottom of the ocean, there's 11 kilometer um, variation. Uh, in the diagram, is saying that highest flight is 20 kilometers. Actually, you can, you know, we, we consider often the effect and variation of density up to the edge of space at so 100 kilometers. So there's a much, much larger variation in both gravity and in density. So, to clarify that there is a variation in gravity, but it's what we're going to show here that it's actually something that we can ignore. The, this is the um, Newton's universal law of gravitational attraction. And this is saying that the ratio of, or, or the gravitational acceleration between two point masses is equal to the inverse um, square of the distance between them. So if you have two masses, so an object and the center of a planet, Earth, then the force of, of gravity that is acting from both sides between them is equal to the square of their distance. It's also equal to the, the product of their masses as well, but because the mass of Earth is essentially much, much larger than the mass of the object and it's constant, we combine that number into the, the number that ends up being 9.81. And what we're showing here is if we go 20 kilometers above Earth and find the difference in gravity at that point, it's only less than, it's barely 1% of, of what it is at the surface. It's going to be less. Gravity is obviously decreasing as you go higher, as you go away from the surface. But it's, going to, it's only going to have reduced by about 1%. In contrast, the density changes massively from the surface of Earth, where it's, uh, the density of air is 1.25 uh, kilograms per meters cubed, to the edge of space, where effectively it's zero. So we need to take that into account if we're going to look at how the, the forces are changing in the atmosphere. And this is where it starts, you know, there's, there's some examples of some more challenging problems. So far, we've introduced the main, the basic kind of um, things that we uh, need to, to, to apply the hydrostatic pressure law to. But here, uh, I'm giving you two examples of more complicated problems. I'm not going to go through them now. They're both introduced in the supporting video, and they're going to be the subject of tutorial questions in the next few weeks. But I just want to introduce how you approach them. So the first one, <clears throat> you have stratified fluids. So in this example, you have the, the, the least dense fluid, oil, stratified above water, which is stratified above a greater density glycerin and a greater density mercury. And in order to find the pressure at the bottom, we have to apply the hydrostatic law progressively from one, sir, one interface to the next. And the way that we do this is by using um, points to define the locations that we're going to do the analysis at, and then to you know, step by step from point one to point two, all the way to five, to work out what is the incremental pressure. And we use this, um, we're going to do this um, on Monday in a lot more detail, to measure, to, to measure the pressure, for example, in a wind tunnel. So we use this in, in, the, in the subject of manometry where we're looking at how the pressure changes in different fluids transmit to different changes in height of those fluids. And then we can use the height variation of those fluids to measure it. We just need to measure those height differences to, to find a value for the pressure. So all we need to know for now is that you can step progressively through the different fluids, changing just the density, the locations, and their vertical positions, and we can combine that into an expression that gives us a sum of the variation of the pressures as it goes through different fluids. So the expression that uh, we form is essentially just the starting pressure plus the specific weight times the vertical height through which you go. Like I said, there's going to be... Um, so 
uh, some example questions out in the next in the next week or so. So I'm just kind of preparing you for that here. This is probably something that you would be expected to be able to do in an exam. In contrast, this probably isn't, but it's something that you're going to need to know. You know that it exists because it's fundamental to um, aerodynamics and it's fundamental to um, gas laws. So in this example, we've got a picture of the atmosphere. We've got some kind of um, basic description of how the atmospheric quantities are changing with height. And we're then applying a variable density using an ideal gas equation uh, to, to obtain a much more complicated integral. And we have to assume different uh, laws, different variation of pressure for different parts of the atmosphere. This is just the kind of an introduction to that. I go, I go through that in much more detail in the supporting video to show how you can uh, obtain those equations. But again, you know, this is, this is for your background information. It's not necessarily something that you'd be asked to do on demand in an exam. But be aware that while in most cases in a liquid we're assuming the density to be constant, we definitely can't say that for an, a, a gas. And so we need to be um, kind of conscious of how to use that analysis. So yeah, if you want to see more about that or the other, the other kind of more complicated problem, have a look on Blackboard. And next week, we will be looking at pressure measurements. Right, that's it. See you Monday. Have a good weekend. Stay as long as it takes, but I'll just get out of the way. So, can I ask for something? Yeah, yeah, yeah.